Okay, welcome. This is the Sec 3 weather lesson number 3. As you probably know now, I am not in school. So please cooperate with the relief teacher and we will run through some recall over what has happened the last lesson as well as continue with the important information for this lesson. If you are copying down certain information and you're running out of time, let the relief teacher know and she or he will pause. Now during the last lesson, we covered one of the core factors as to why temperature will vary from place to place. So we covered altitude. Now I want you to recall that height of a place okay, in relation to sea level will lead to a change in temperature. Generally, when you have an increase in altitude, meaning that you go higher up, you will have a fall in temperature. This is important. Please remember this relationship. The general rule of thumb is for every 1000 meters increase in altitude, you will lose about 6.5 degrees in temperature. Now it is important to note that the 6.5 degrees is not an absolute number. So depending on other conditions prevalent at the location, uh, it is possible to lose slightly less or slightly more. Now you won't feel this in Singapore because we don't have a relief feature that is above 1000 meters. The fundamental reason for this phenomenon happening is because as you go higher up, the air becomes less dense. So as a result, being less dense is less compact and so it cannot absorb as much heat. So being that it cannot absorb so much heat, your temperature will be lower. Now for the lower part of the uh, height range, it is the opposite. So the lower you are, the denser the air will be and as a result, it's more compact, it can absorb more heat and therefore your temperature will be higher. This is the fundamental concept behind this idea of why as you go higher, temperature will drop. Okay, we talk about this as well. Uh, please remember that when you talk about the heat that is felt by us, Generally, it is the result of short of long wave radiation, not short wave radiation. So, short wave radiation is the direct heat that comes from the sun. Long wave radiation is the one that actually rebounds off the atmosphere and as a result, heats the, the ambient temperature. So, as you go higher in altitude, you're actually being moved further away from the long wave radiation and therefore the amount of long wave radiation that reaches you will decrease. Okay, remember uh, we talked about this last week about technically if you from from a layman's perspective if you are higher up you should be nearer to the sun and shouldn't you actually feel warmer but remember we're talking about the two different types of radiation and the important thing about it is that the heat we feel is actually not direct from the sun not short wave radiation the heat we feel is long wave radiation that is reflected from the ground and is being rebounded through the atmosphere on the ground. So the higher you are, the cooler it is. Okay, we had a good look at this diagram. Uh, just a quick refresher. So this is a diagram that shows you the long wave versus short wave radiation and how greenhouse gas actually serves as a barrier to trap some of this radiation. The last factor that we covered in the previous lesson was distance from the sea as a factor that affects temperature. Remember the underlying concept for distance from the sea is the physics notion that land heats and cools faster than the sea. So land is a solid, the sea is a liquid, so the liquid is harder to heat up and at the same time harder to cool down as well. So when you have a large water body next to you where you are located, it will actually affect the localized weather conditions and the climate. Take a look at this image, we ran through this, uh, we used two cities in Alaska, Anchorage and Fairbanks as a comparison to show you that although latitude wise they are about the same, distance from the sea affects the temperature range greatly. So if you are near the sea, your temperature range will be very much smaller, your summers will be warmer and your winters, sorry, your summers will be cooler and your winters will be warmer. This is a very important concept, keep this in your mind. Moving on from what we explained earlier, the effect that we are concerned with when you talk about distance from the sea, there are two effects. The first one is the maritime effect. This is the impact on coastal areas 
there's a result of being near the water surface. Now, maritime effect in the summer, it means that the land is heating up faster than the sea, so the land over the sea is cooler than that over the land. As a result, there's this exchange and summers are cooler for the areas nearer to the water surface. Now during winter, the reverse is true, so the land is able to cool down very quickly, however the sea isn't. So there is a warm current that is kept around this immediate area. As a result, the overall temperature of areas near the sea during winter is going to be warmer. The reverse effect is called continental effect. Basically, these are inland areas that are unfortunately not near any sort of water body that is significant enough. So these inland areas, because there is no buffer created by the air currents that is above the sea, your winters can be very very cold and your, and your summers can be very very hot. Typical areas that suffer from this, uh, in your examples, or rather examples given in your textbook, are cities like Beijing. So if we take a look at Vancouver versus uh, Minot in US, so you can see actually the range when you do not have the water surface buffering right between your maximum and minimum can be rather significant in this case over almost reaching 20 degrees difference okay so whereas if we look at vancouver the difference is about 10 degrees max okay now we're moving on to the fresh reason uh, one that you have not covered before so if you at any moment are still copying some of the information down please alert the relief teacher and my dear relief teacher could you kindly hit the pause button for them while they copy down the relevant information first thank you so now we're going to cover the, the condition of cloud cover and how it actually impacts temperature all right now as the name is self-explanatory cloud cover actually refers to the extent of the sky covered by clouds so the more clouds you have the smaller difference between your day and night temperatures so the clouds actually serve as a form of uh, insulation buffer to, to help maintain the temperature so generally if you do not have this layer of clouds present then your day and night temperature will be vastly different so you will have a very big diurnal temperature range and this is very common in deserts so in a desert it can be very very hot in the daytime over 55 degrees however at night it can fall to near zero okay right very recently i came across the couple of images on social media uh, showing snow in the desert now in daytime temperatures in the winter time it is not unusual to have uh, it dip below freezing point overnight and as a result it can snow in the desert it is not due to climate change it's got nothing to do with global warming As you can see from the diagram on the left of the screen, in the presence of clouds, uh, they actually help to reflect a portion of the sun's ray back into space. So not all of the shortwave radiation that comes from the sun will be uh, shining directly on the ground. Uh, so as a result, you do have a slightly lower daytime temperature. Then during the night time, the clouds are able to absorb more of the heat that's radiated and prevent it from escaping into space. So it then again raises the nighttime temperature, which makes it closer to the daytime temperature. So when you look at the temperatures of a location with clouds, the thermal temperature range difference between maximum and minimum will be smaller. Now what about a place that uh, has no clouds? So if you look at the picture here, you can see quite clearly it's a desert area. There is a clear absence of clouds. So during the daytime, a large amount of the sun's rays will heat the earth and eventually the surface will heat up rapidly and your overall temperature will be very high. And for the night time, uh, because there's no clouds to rebound the heat backwards, consequently, the heat is lost at a very rapid rate so nighttime temperatures can be very very cold this leads to a situation where your thermal temperature range will be very large i repeat thermal temperature range is the difference between your maximum and minimum temperature so if you need a little bit more time to copy uh, maybe this is a good time to hit the pause button 
Okay, class assignment number two. Now I'm gonna take you through this assignment. There are two graphs on the screen here. Both show you maximum and minimum temperature of two locations. So the question asks which diagram represents temperatures at a desert. Okay, explain your answer. So you need to look at the range that is shown between these two locations and you need to consider what the temperature range is like at the desert. So taking a look at diagram A, so look at the temperature, difference, okay, consistently it is about, about 15 degrees, okay, 15 degrees difference between the maximum and minimum temperatures. When you take a look at diagram B, diagram B, the temperature range is now only about 10 degrees or at certain points it drops to about 5 degrees so bear in mind uh, diagram b location has smaller temperature range than diagram a now we take a look once again at both diagrams side by side think about what we just learned about cloud cover okay and the desert so a desert has less cloud cover when you have less cloud cover, what does it mean for your temperature range? Will it be bigger or will it be smaller? Okay, have that consideration in your head now. I'll give you two more seconds to think about it. Okay, and the answer is of course diagram A is the desert because it has the larger temperature range. And if you look at the range in January as well as in December, it's actually sub-zero. During the winter months, it is possible to have sub-zero temperature in the desert at night. But in the daytime, it is about 15 degrees and it stretches upwards. So this actually lends itself more readily to being a desert. Okay. Right now, I'm going to introduce a device to you. It's called a maximum and minimum thermometer. Another name for this is the Sixes thermometer, depending on which book you're looking at. So what does this device actually measure? This is actually a combination thermometer, which if you leave it alone in a location for 24 hours, it will show you within this time range, what was the maximum temperature recorded and the minimum temperature experience in this location. Important fact when you are reading this, when you're trying to read this, you're not going to look at the liquid level of either side. You're going to look at the lowest point of the metal index, which is within the thermometer itself. The bottom of the metal index will correspond to a reading on the side, and that is the temperature you're looking at. So as we were saying, if you take a look at the index on the left, the blue index, okay, what we're reading is the bottom of the index, so it is approximately 20 degrees. If you're reading the wrong thing, you're reading the liquid level, you end up with a reading of 25 degrees. Now similarly, if you look on the one on the right hand side, which is the maximum temperature recorded, it is close to 25, 26 degrees. Now some precautions to take when you're placing one of these to do data collection number one it has to be elevated at least 1.5 meters above the ground so that you are not affected by the heat that's emitting directly from the ground you're measuring ambient temperature and the reading will be more accurate okay the second thing is this should not be in direct sunlight okay so hold it three minutes take two readings take the average this is the common precautions and good practices when you are measuring temperature with a thermometer. Okay, now please remember when you're doing GI, one of the most common ways to increase accuracy is to take more readings. So the more readings you take, the higher data set. When you average it out, you, you possibly negate most of the errors that you have. Another reason why students are encouraged to take multiple readings is due to inherent errors like parallax error, data error due to equipment failure, which if you were to take less than three readings, you may not realize that it's 
is evident. Or if you only use one set of equipment and take from one location, you will not realize that there is an equipment error. So please remember, take more readings, take the average. And so we have come to the end of this section on what influences temperature. So your four key influencer of temp temperature, like influencer, important. Uh. So latitude, where you are, distance from the equator, the higher you are in latitude or the lower you are, the further away from the equator, the lower the temperature will be. Generally, uh, altitude. Remember, height of a place in relation to sea level, the higher you go, the colder it is. Remember the golden formula, every 1000 meters increase in elevation, you drop approximately 6.5 degrees. Thirdly, distance from the sea, we learned this, the key concepts are maritime effect and continental effect. Okay, And lastly, cloud cover. So these are the four influences influences of temperature okay it is important and most of the time for O levels these come out as content questions uh, they will once in a while test you as a open-ended question asking which is the more important factor or stating one and telling you that this is the most important factor so if we are to analyze these four factors on their own, the one that supersedes the other factors, the other three, is actually altitude. Because you have different latitudes, uh, different latitude points on, on planet Earth. If one is at a higher altitude, let's say 3000 meters elevation, it's going to have a different temperature regardless of the latitude. Similarly, if two locations are both near the sea or away from the sea, one of them that is elevated at let's say 2,500 meters will definitely also have a lower temperature than the other. Similarly, cloud cover, both locations in the desert, in the sub-Saharan desert, uh, one is on top of a mountain like Mount Kilimanjaro, with altitude increase, you're going to have lower temperature. So the one that overrides the other three factors is actually altitude. Now having said that, uh, keep it in mind because if you were to argue against altitude being the most significant factor, it is no longer a logical argument. And in geography, logical arguments are the essence of our discipline. So whatever sort of argument you want to put across, please make sure that you read it, read what you've written and make sure that it is logical. If it's not logical, it will not stand up to scrutiny and you will not score the marks. Okay, we've come to the end of the first section of this video. Now take a couple of minutes, digest the information, flip back and take a look at any of the data that you need is missing. Okay, I'll give you a couple of minutes, run through the data, copy it from your friends. Okay, before we move on to the activity for the day, which is in the next video.